Okay, please mute your, your sound. So we are studying the Book of Romans, like you know. Uh, let's move on. So last week, uh, the past two weeks, we did uh, chapter one through chapter three, understand that everyone, every, every single one is under condemnation. No. We are born in sin and condemned by our, for, because of our sins. But praise God, by faith and by grace, we are justified when you believe Jesus Christ as our Savior. And now, sanctification. Now that we are believers, how should we live our new life? We need to be saints before God. And so we are going to take two chapters today. It's a lot, I know. But let's go and see what you can do, okay? So, six and seven. Thank uh, you, my darling. Do we have the audio Yeah. Rolando, please mute your, your uh, sound. Rolando, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so, chapter six is a lot about uh, theology, it's theology of sanctification. And so, uh, since it is theological, I'm going to just give some uh, definitions of the theology of sanctification, okay? And then we go to chapter 6. A sanctification is as simple as it is a personal separation. Sanctification is separation from all that is sin and impure into dedication to God. So it's leaving what is simple and go towards what is holy dedication to God, to everything that is holy. So, and we see that sanctification occurs in three stages or three phases. There is a positional, progressive, and perfect. So let me show each one of those, okay? The positional sanctification is the past. It happens at the moment that we believe Jesus is our savior. So that moment that we trust Jesus is our savior, our sins are forgiven, and we, uh, uh, Romans 5, 1 say, we were saved from the condemnation of sin. And then, and then Hebrews 10, 10 says, we were sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ offered once for all. So we were sanctified. So that's the past. At the moment that we believe Jesus is our Savior, we are justified. We are no longer condemned. We are free from sin in this way that sin can no longer send us to have to hell okay because we are um, declared sanctified or i mean justified or innocent before god and then there is the progressive that we, we're going to discuss today the progressive sanctification is today it's the present sanctification occurs with daily confession of sin in a continuously walk with God in obedience, prayer, reading the Bible, doing everything that we can do to keep our lives uh, holy before our God. We are still sinners, but we can be holy. We have to. And so we are being saved from the power of sin. Like Romans 6, 14 says that sin has, sin has no longer power over us. And Hebrews 10, 14 says, because through a single sacrifice of Christ, he has forever perfected, perfected those being sanctified. So it's a process. It's a continuous process. Being sanctified. So it progresses. And the third one is the sanctification perfect. It's in the future yet. So it's, it's called glorification. We're going to see that in chapter 8. Glorification is the final stage in heaven when we will be like Christ and never again we will sin against our God. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, because we are still sinners. But we will be saved from the presence of sin. That's why we will no longer sin against our God. So uh, 1 John 3, 2 says, but we know that when Christ appears, when he comes back, 
we shall be like him. You know, you know, so for we shall see him as he is. Praise the Lord. That's our hope that when Jesus comes back, when we will, when we will die, we will no longer sin against our God. So Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in our salvation, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So that's our hope. So till then, we have to work hard to be sane before our God. And that's the message of chapter 6. So let's go to Romans chapter 6. Keep your Bible open if you can, if you will. And so let's see that chapter 6 is, is there is a relation. We are coming from chapter 1. It's the whole uh, uh, book that we're gonna, we are studying. So chapter 6 will relate to chapter 5 and 2, 8 discussing the results of sanctification by faith. And one of the results uh, as well is that we need to be sent. We can be sanctified. And so in chapter 6, we introduced this uh, objection that uh, Paul starts with verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Some people would think that. So now that we are under grace, we can't sin as we want, because we'll be forgiven. Yeah? Some people think like that, and they live like that. But Paul says, mm -hmm. he will respond to that, saying, we need to be sent. We need to dis, uh, dis, uh, uh, develop our sanctification before our God. And so the, the basis of sanctification, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, he says, we need to die to sin. Some would say that justification by faith encourages to, to, to sin. And they think the more grace, the more sin, the more grace. The more we sin, the more God will show his grace. Oh, some people live, live like that. You know that, right? We see in church, we see friends living a life like that. So are you really a believer? I don't know about that. Because they live in the way that uh, other people who don't know Christ, they live just like that. And so they would say, let's continue sinning so that grace will cover everything. Uh -uh. Paul says, are you crazy? Not at all, by no means, he says. Several times he says that in chapter six and seven, I mark probably seven times that he says, no way, by no means, not at all, don't think about it. And so this makes Paul sad some way that the Christians will think like that. So those who die to sin, he says, cannot continue living in sin. He says, we need to die to sin. How can we die to sin? Death to sin means repentance, to renounce sin, to avoid sinning, to stop committing that sin. It's to kill by the root sin in our life. In Proverbs 28, 28, 13 says, whoever conceals or keeps, uh, conceals their sins does not prosper. But those who confess and renounce then they will find mercy. So that's what you need to do. You con not conceal, not keep sinning, but confess and stop sinning. And so... Verse uh, 3 to 5, Paul says that we need to not only kill the sin, but live in a, with a new life, the newness of life. We cannot continue living in our sins because we died for it. Our death to sin needs to be shown, it is shown like a, a burial. So it's interesting that Paul uses this illustration and he takes the baptism, the figure of baptism, to show that. He says, it's like the baptism. In baptism, where we are there, and the pastors take us and put us under the water, and we raise again to live for Christ, right? 
So that's the illustration of death. We die, we are buried, and we rise again to live a new life. Here he uses this illustration of baptism. It's not a teaching about baptism. We can use that to teach, but it's not the whole thing about baptism. Baptism is just an, just an illustration how it happens, how we need to die for sin and live a new life for Christ. So we die for the world to live for Christ. This is to walk in a newness of life, like he says here in verse 4. We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's the figure of baptism. So let's see some attitudes that we can take for our sanctification. Verses 6 and 7 he says, kill the old nature. We have two natures now. We have a new nature in Christ, but we have the old nature that is sinful. We need to kill that every day. And that thing is not easy to, to, to be killed, okay? So that's why we struggle uh, with sin. But we have to kill that daily. So we participate in Christ's death when we are saved. But now we have both two natures, the old nature that was crucified, and, 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 but we have a new nature that can help us to live for Christ. So we are in a war, literally. So let's keep on going here, but we need to kill the old nature. And by killing the old nature, we need to live a new life for Christ, verse 8 through 11. And so Paul makes several contrasts here uh, as a uh, comparison between one and another. He says, dying and living. We need to die for sin and live for Christ. We need to renounce sin and we have to live for God in Christ Jesus. And he says in verse 11, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This will help us to live a, a life by grace and be victorious over sin. Because sin has no longer power over us because we live under grace, not under sin, under sin, under law, the law. So, and Paul says in verse 13, do not offer your body members to sin. It's a decision that we all individually need to make daily. Lord, today I offered my body. I offered my eyes. I offered my ears, my mouth my heart, my mind, protect me from doing or seeing or saying or thinking anything that is against your holiness, God. So it's a daily prayer, daily decision that we need to make by offering our bodies, our members, the members of our bodies to God for our sanctification. And we must surrender to sin. We must not surrender to sin, but to God. This way we win, win by the grace of God. In verse 14, it is amazing. That is an, a motivation that we, uh, since we are not under the law, but under the grace, and the grace sin in some way has no power over us. We sin because we want. But we can overcome that. By being under grace is not an excuse for sin. It's a weapon that we have. Because of God's grace, we can win. We can say, no, I'm not, a, I'm not going to do that because that displeases our God. In this way, verse 15 through 23, he says, like we are doing this, we need to serve God, not serve our sinful nature. Now that we are under grace, we can become slaves of God, not of sin. We can uh, do this. It's our choice. We have only two choices, actually. Either we choose to serve the justice or serve God by obeying from heart because we are set free from sin 
and to serve God with a clean life, a clear life, and a, a, a just, a righteous life that pleases our God. So it's our decision. We can make that decision. Either we will serve God with a clean life or we will choose to sin. It's our decision. God gave us that decision. Unfortunately, we make this choice, but we can do the other choice. And Paul refers to our service to God as an obligation. We are not in choosing serving or not. It is a mandatory privilege. We have the privilege to serve God, but this is a mandatory. We are to serve God with a new life that he gave us in Christ. And so the result, the result of serving to sin will bring shame. We know that, right? And death. The result of serving our God brings sanctification and eternal life. That's simple as that, Paul, Paul puts in here. What we're going to what are we going to decide? Live in shame and live like dead? Or live in sanctification and showing eternal life, life in abundance like Christ promises us? So the conclusion of chapter 6 is in verse 22 and 23. It says, But now that you have been set free from sin, it's powerful this, we have been set free free. We're still sinful. We still have our old nature, but we have been set free. There's no power of sin in us. We sin if we want. Now that we have been set free and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. We know that. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord for that. So that's the end of chapter 6. So let's see now the conflict. <laughs> it's amazing. This is a very interesting chapter uh, about sanctification. And Paul shows <laughs> what sinful nature can do to us, right? So he shows his, himself is in his struggle with this terrible sinful nature that we still have. And so chapter 7, we'll continue the, the explanation of how can we be sanctified in Christ with a new life. Chapter 6 just said that we are set free. We're no longer condemned. Sin has no power over us. Now we are slaves to justice for sanctification. So we are in a battle with two natures. The old sinful nature is here. But we have a new nature that is holy. And there is a war in us. We all live in a war daily, continuously. The question is, who is going to win? The sinful nature or the holy new nature? Let's see. Paul uses marriage as an illustration let me tell you this is not a chapter on marriage okay it's just an illustration if you like to learn about marriage go to ephesians colossians and first peter they have better instructions there for marriage this is just an illustration a lawful illustration what happens in marriage and paul uses that to illustrate how uh it happens happens uh, with our nature dying for sin or and so on and so forth. So the basic proposition in chapter 7, verse 1, is that the law does not obligate the dead. Whoever is dead don't need to pay any bills. Whoever died, it's free from bills, from laws, from any commitment that he made. Maybe the family will be <laughs> in charge of that, but he is free. The one who died, no more commitment, okay? So whoever dies is free from the law. And Paul says this using the marriage as an illustration. So uh, it's interesting. So death, death frees 
a person from the law of marriage, right? The one, if somebody dies, the other one is free from matrimonial law. Okay, if the husband died, the wife can do whatever. She can marry anybody she wants. She is free, and the other one is free too. So, until death do us apart, remember? So, death will do us apart. The application of that is, since we die to sin, and the law does not obligate us, uh, any dead per person, then we are free from the law. So, what happens here? Verse 6, it's very clear. But now, by dying to what we once bound us, the sin, we have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit. So, in Christ's death, we he, Christ, has satisfied the requirement of the law for us in our place, in, in, our, in our union with Christ. In his death, we are set free. Again, that's the illustration of baptism as well. When we are uh, in Christ, we died for him and with him, and we raised like Christ to live a new life. In marriage, is the same thing. Whoever dies, since we die to sin, that has no more power over us. But we still are in this war, right? The war of the two natures. Not that we are justified by faith and no longer condemned. We have a new nature, new life. But we still have the old nature there, very alive in us, sinful. And here are our war. We have a, uh, here is our war. So what to do with the law? That's the question in chapter 7, verses 7 through 14. How about the law? Should we still obey? Uh, good question, right? Should we still obey the Ten Commandments? Why not? But there are some laws that we are free from obeying. It's not related to us. And Paul replies, uh, the misunderstanding by explaining the purpose of the law. So let's see. Uh, somebody asked, is the law, is the law sinful? Verse 7. So the law made us sin, right? No, 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 no. And Paul says, verse 7, what shall we say then? And Paul, Paul puts himself in a, a Jew uh, uh, side and he says let's imagine that this person is thinking that the law is sinful because it makes us sin and so is the law sinful and Paul says certainly not not at all by no means it's not sinful sin took advantage <laughs> I like this because Paul personifies sin here says sin took advantage of the law as an opportunity to commit the mistake or the, 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 the sin. And so, uh, like a, a sin was a person. Sin took advantage. How is that? And so, the law said not to do. And sin says, yes, do it. So the problem was not the law. It was the sinful man, the person. So that's why Paul personifies sin, like sin was a person. Sin is in us. We make the decision. And so he says in verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. Oh yeah? You're blaming sin, not yourself. <laughs> like we, sin is the responsible for our sin. No, we are responsible. We let sin go free. But we have been set free from sin. And Paul says, verse 12, you have to understand that the law is holy. Yes. If the law is holy, did that which is good, verse 12 says, 13 says, 12 says, did that which is good become death to me? That what was good, it's holy, now become death to me? Verse, uh, he says here, in verse, uh, I guess, 12. Yeah, verse 12. So then, 
the law is holy and the commandments holy. Uh, verse 13, did that which is good then become death to me? He says, no, by no means, certainly not. It was not the law, but sin using the law that caused death. Again, sin is responsible. We are the sinful. So we know that the law is spiritual. The law is no sin. But I am not. He says, I am sold. I was sold as a slave to sin. He's talking about his, our old nature. I was sold as a slave to sin. And so this explanation of this war uh, uh, with the two natures, verses 15 through 25, he says, uh, sinful nature versus new nature, the explanation. We have a sinful nature versus a uh, new nature. We have the inner man, which is holy, which looks for God and it wants to live a, a holy and, and godly life. But we have the outer man, sinful with the old nature. We have a carnal desires. Yes, we do. But we also have a spiritual desires, right? We like to read the Bible, we like to pray, we like to help others, we like to go to church, to worship God. But we also have desires to do something that is not pleasing to God. We have pleasure in the law of God, but we also have pleasure of sin. Wow, what a life we have to live with this war in us, right? And so, and so Paul, in several verses there, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, that I do. Do you feel the same? I think we all feel the same, right? We wake up in the morning, we pray, Lord, I give my life, I, I give you my body, uh, I want to serve you, I want to be a blessing, and then we go driving to our work, and then uh, somebody's not moving, <laughs> somebody doesn't move, that person's not in, in a hurry, but I am, get out of my way! And then we start, oh, then, forgive me, and then, then uh, yeah, go on and on. You get late to your work or appointment. You are, and that's the way we are, right? So I want to do what is good, but I don't. And what I hate, I do. Oh Lord, what should I do now? That's the reality of sin in us. In verse twenty one says, "So I find this law at work, although I want to do good." It was right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. We are in a war. And make me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Oh, Lord. When that is going to end? Yeah, Paul had the same question. And so he screamed, like we can hear the scream. What a ratted man I am! We did the same, right? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? It's a cry that we all do, like Paul. Lord, I don't like that. But that is good news. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And my friends, when Christ returns, when, when we die, we, by the, the coming of the Lord Jesus, we'll be transformed and we will never again sin against our God. And that's the message of Romans chapter 8. I hope you will read this week and next week we will deal only with Romans 8. It is uh, sanctification towards glorification. 
And when we die, and by the coming second come of Christ, we will be transformed like he is, and we will never again sin. That's the good news. But while we are here dealing with these two natures, we have to make a decision. Sin has no power. We can overcome sin if we be sanctified daily. So, with the two natures that we have, we want to serve God, the new nature, and sinful nature is right here, leading us to sin. And so, we need to fight. It is a, a war. We all... Christians are in the same war, okay? All of us. And so what is the solution? What are the weapons that we have to win against sin? First, since we are sinners, we are going to sin. We need to confess daily and immediately our sins. Don't let sin free in your life. If you did, ask God to forgive you. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he will do what? He will forgive us and he will cleanse us, right? And so do not give in to temptations. We will be tempted to do something that uh, is wrong. It is against God's holiness. It's against our holiness. But we do not need to give in to temptations. We need to live a clean life with prayer, reading the word of God, and doing everything that we can to fill our minds with things that pleases God and help us to be strong spiritually, feeding our new nature and not our old nature. If we do that, we'll be walking full of the Spirit. And if we, if we, if we are continually full of the Holy Spirit, we will not give in to flesh. So we will be holy as God is holy and he will please in us and we will be strong spiritually and sanctified. So like Galatians 5.16 says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so, the best thing we can do is to walk by the Spirit. We can do that because the Holy Spirit lives in us. We see that in Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit, a God, lives in us. He makes us. He helps us in our weaknesses. And He will help us to overcome sinful nature. So that's the best thing we can do. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your name that we are no longer under sin. We have been forgiven once for all. We are justified by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us a new life, a new nature, where we all struggle like Paul so wisely told you, Lord, we are wretched men. We struggle, Lord, with sin in our lives. We ask you to forgive us and to help us live a life that pleases you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Help us to overcome sin. Help us, Lord, not to give in to temptations. Help us to live with the Holy Spirit full in us, filled of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to do that daily. Because this will bring glory to you and holiness to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for our time together in your word. And thank you for the Holy Spirit being our teacher today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen, my friends. So... We still have some minutes. If you like to, if you have any questions, we can answer some. Some have to leave to leave for their uh, to church. But uh, those who are here, if you have any questions, let's 
answer together those questions. I just want to make a comment that this yes, is yes, please. as we we're reading this in um in the first part of chapter six, it start it it uh the comments underneath there uh talks about how death is a separation. And I was struck with how easily we accept the separation from life, like when somebody dies, we we ex accept that as permanent and um what was the physical death spiritual death is separation from god we believe that um eternal separation from god we all believe that and the other one is death to sin separation from sin and my mm -hmm. what i was wondering is why don't we accept that just as strongly that we can be that separated because we we understand the concept of death as separation right I think with sin, we say, well, I have a sinful nature. I can't really, I can't really do anything about that. So we don't, we don't really accept the separation right. from death as a, po I mean, the death of sin as a possibility, or at least I feel like that in my own life is like, well, you know, I'm only right. But You're right. In every You're other right. circumstance, when it says the death of something, we accept it as final and as something that's very strong and very permanent. And I feel like that that should be how we look at sin too, is that our separation from sin, mm -hmm. even though we're going to sin, it should, we should look on it as a very thing that we can separate from, you know. You're so right. And good thinking. The only problem with uh, this death is that we need to kill the sinful nature daily. Yeah. <laughs> it's not once for all. Yeah. Yeah, that, we, we kill today, tomorrow is, ah, I'm back. Yeah. You need to kill every day. I think we just need to believe that it's possible, though, because sometimes it is it's, possible. It's like you sin and think, well, you know, it's it's gonna happen, you know. Uh, <laughs> Instead of saying putting everything you have into killing that sinful nature, we like that sinful nature. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that I found is uh, when I try to read the Bible and listen to the TV at the same time. It doesn't work. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> you, have to, you have to concentrate on one, not the other. I don't know, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good thinking. Any other comments or questions? Love you all. Love mm -hmm. you too, Rolando. Yes. So, Read one or two or three times Romans chapter 8. It's so deep. It's so beautiful. It will help us to understand what's ahead of us. Okay? The glorification. And then we will no longer sin. Because amen. we'll be... Amen. I said. Amen? You said amen? Okay. My wife said amen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that was for me, okay? <laughs> we no longer sing. Amen, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning you'll do what she says. Uh, okay. I'm into that. I'm into that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's read chapter eight and, and deal with that next week. Okay. It has been wonderful for me to, to study. And I'm teaching uh, the same book in Portuguese every Saturday. Yesterday we covered chapter 11 to the Chinese people. So it's been wonderful doing in both languages at the same time. So I'm learning a lot. All right, guys, have a wonderful, blessed, sanctified day, holy day for you, okay? <laughs> okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye, everyone. Love you Bye, all. Bye, guys. Love you. Bye.